Hello. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Ruth Dickey. I have the tremendous pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation, and I am thrilled to welcome you to our to tonight's 535 ceremony with so many huge thanks to Margot Cohen, Mr. Rucci, and the whole team at the Brooklyn Museum for being such incredible, thoughtful partners in welcoming us here tonight, and to the Brooklyn Museum shop for acting as our booksellers. As Margot shared, this is the first time ever that we're opening up this event to the public, and we're so thrilled to be gathered with all of you in such a beautiful space to celebrate books. At the National Book Foundation, our mission is to celebrate the best literature published in the United States, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in our culture. We do this both through our year-round public and education programs, which bring books and authors to readers all over the country, and through our awards and honors, which tonight means celebrating five exceptional books honored by our Five Under 35 program. A special thanks is due to the Five Under 35 sponsor, the Amazon Literary Partnership, who have been the sole supporter of Five Under 35 since its inception in 2006. We're so very grateful to Al Woodworth and the ALP team. That's not to say, however, that we don't need your support. If you believe in the work of connecting readers with books as much as we do, we'd love for you to visit our website and help make our work possible at nationalbook.org. The 535 program is very near and dear to my heart. Every year we ask five selectors, authors who have been recognized by the foundation, to each pick a debut fiction author someone whose work promises to leave a lasting impression on the literary landscape. We see this prize as the firmest and sweetest acknowledgement and affirmation to please keep going, keep writing. We can't wait to read what will come next. To kick us off, let's begin by giving our 2023 535 honorees a huge round of applause. <laughs> We are so excited to celebrate you, Matteo Escaripor, Chelsea T. Hicks, Morgan Talti, Jenny Shia, and Ada Zhang. Welcome to the family. And of course, tonight would not be possible without our selectors to whom we are so grateful. Louise Erdrich, Robert Jones Jr., Jamil Jan Kochai, Karen Russell, and Kirsten Valdez Quaid. While Louise, Karen, and Kirsten were unable to join us in person tonight, we're thrilled to have some very, very special guests join us in their stead. Kali Fajardo Einstein, Kevin Nguyen, and Jim Shepard. Yeah, right? <laughs> Last but not least, many, many thanks to the National Book Foundation staff and interns, board of directors, and book council for their tireless support Extra special thanks to Madeline Shelton, Natalie Green, and Emily Lovett for their hard work making tonight's event possible. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, now let's get the fun rolling. I'm honored to introduce our stupendous, brilliant host for the evening, who will take it from here. Wajahat Ali is a Daily Beast columnist, public speaker, recovering attorney, and tired dad of three cute kids. He is the author of the book, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on becoming American and the play, The Domestic Crusaders. Let's give a warm welcome to Wajahat. Prepare to be awed by my stupendous hosting, everyone. Uh, Brooklyn, how you doing? People, I did not come here all the way on coach from Virginia for that tepid response. To quote the late, great Bernie Mac, I'm not here for any foolishness. We have to endure a lot. We're enduring a pandemic, rising fascism, inflation. Sometimes to feel that you're alive, you have to be loud. So when I ask you, oh, Brooklyn, how you doing? I expect to hear from a living, breathing, loud audience. Brooklyn, how are you doing tonight? To quote my Pakistani immigrant mother, not bad. <laughs> Very well done, by the way. Excellent translation. 
Uh, indeed, I am here as your host during AAPI month. Yay, Asians, yay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, but I'll be very honest with you and blunt throughout the evening, I was not the first choice. Uh, they went to uh, Hari Kondabolu first, he said no. Then they went to Hasan Minhaj, he was busy. Then they went to Riz Ahmed, he's making movies. Then they went to Mindy Kaling, she said no. Then they went to Fried Zakaria, he was busy. Then they went to Ali Velchi, all of them said no, and I'm here as your desperate last pick, seventh Asian choice for tonight's host. Sorry, five under five, this, under 35, this is what you get. I'll take all pity applause. Uh, thank you for the pity applause, I'm grateful for the free falafel sandwich I get afterwards, maybe. Uh, tonight, we are here in Brooklyn and we will be playing with some of the most dangerous, radical, frightening, exciting, dangerous, and polarizing toys in America. Words. We live in a country, America, where some parents are more comfortable with their kids getting shot at school than reading a book written by Toni Morrison or reading a poem written by Amanda Gorman. In some places, I won't say which ones, that rhyme with Florida, <laughs> too soon, you can't say the word gay. Because if you say the word gay, that apparently makes your child gay. Uh, uh, I am 05 under 35. I'm a decaying sack of brown flesh in his 40s. I'm 42, I apologize. But that means for the rest of the evening, I will be using exquisite 80s and 90s pop culture references. You might not understand this. You can Google it. Uh, there's a remake to this movie that we saw called Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice 2 is filming right now with Jenny Ortega, so it's relevant. Um, for those who don't know, I think Beetlejuice rules apply to the gays. If you say it three times, they magically appear. So I want to just test it out. Gay, gay, gay. Are there any gays here? Any gays? There's a gay, one gay, two gays, three gays. Four gays in the back, five gays, six gays. Like magic, you say gay, and Doctor Strange opens up the gay portal and gays appear. Welcome, gays. Thank you. But don't say gay. You also can't say the dangerous words diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, in some places, if you say this, it will get you fired in some corporations, in some states where you are a librarian. You also can't teach AP African American Studies because according to some, this history does not have any quote, merit. Instead, the stories that feature the rest of us as co-protagonists of the American narratives, those of us growing up in the 80s and 90s who were never the heroes, the good guys, or the action hero who got the girl at the end, we must be excised and removed from the libraries, we must be censored, or we must be banned. If we're lucky though, we still get to be the villains, or maybe the sidekicks, or sometimes even the punchline. And a question I have, is it better to be the villain or to be invisible? Because at least the villain has a speaking part. Whoever plays the Joker gets an Academy Award. But if you're invisible, it's like you don't exist. You see, in America, our stories apparently make some of our fellow Americans feel, quote, uncomfortable. Instead, they prefer lies and myths and conspiracies to feel great again. Too soon or not soon enough. And we should all agree that stories have power because if they didn't, why would they be trying to ban our stories? Stories have outlasted empires and fascists. In America, everybody wants to move towards reconciliation. But another question I have for you, how do you get to reconciliation without truth? You can't and you don't. And in America, if I do say one wise thing today, maybe one wise thing, remember this, if you aren't writing your story, your story is always being written for you by others. And if you aren't telling your story, your story will always be told to you by others. So tonight, in honor of our young five under 35 storytellers and stories, we will be celebrating these young writers who continue to create, delight, resist, unearth, expand, stretch, and reveal this evolving rough draft of a country called America. And in honor of Tina Turner, we aren't gonna do this nice and easy, we're gonna do it nice and rough. And have a great time while we're doing it. Give it up for Tina.
she got better ratings in death than Ron DeSantis on Twitter. Just saying. Personally, stories have saved my life. I was once a shy, overweight child, the son of Pakistani Muslim immigrants, born and raised in the Bay Area, California. Anybody? Bay Area? One person. Thank you for that uh, amazing enthusiasm. I appreciate it. My parents thought it would be hilarious to name me Wajahat, to blend, uh, in the United States of America. I didn't learn English even though I was born and raised here until I went to Child's Hideaway Preschool where they dropped me off at ESL, English as Second Language, where in the 1980s it was just the four people of color in one room trying to learn English, and yet I graduated from UC Berkeley with an English major, became a recovering attorney, married way up to a badass doctor who was the high school varsity cheerleader. Hashtag, it gets better. I love America. Um, but I eventually found my voice uh, because of stories, because of the pen. And along the way, I was lucky enough to have mentors and teachers in elementary school, an all-boy Jesuit Catholic high school at UC Berkeley who believed in me and championed me. And sometimes all you need is one person, one friend, one family member, one ally who says, hey kid, you've got something. And so I rode my pen around the world and today I rode my pen from Virginia to Brooklyn where the National Book Foundation and Brooklyn Museum are supporting, honoring emerging writers whose words are imagining a new chapter and future for America and the world. These words belong to short stories and novels. They hail from California, Houston, Oklahoma, Maine, and Brooklyn. These words illuminate fiction full of realism that cuts close and satire that feels like reality. Across five titles, we readers are lucky enough to be immersed in worlds and stories that interrogate what it means to be human, and we are introduced to characters that make us want to keep turning the page long after the books, the short stories, the poems come to an end. Tonight, we also have the pleasure of hearing our selectors and special guests introduce our honorees, previous winners. The baton, the pen, gets passed down, generation to generation. And they will give us a taste, a delicious taste, of these brilliant stories. Following the readings, we're going to invite all the honorees back to the stage for an audience Q&A. We're going to have stationary mics on the side. You can see them to the side. And you will be allowed to ask a question or go on a rambling rant that will be hella awkward for the rest of us, and then we'll be like, hurry it up. Afterwards, there'll be a fancy schmancy event with uh, really ridiculous, excellent cheeses that I can't eat because I'm lactose intolerant, but I still will. In the Beaux Arts Court, to cheer on the authors and the writers, there will be drinks, drinks and books for sale. Buy these books. Some people ban books, we here celebrate books. Right? Right. Without further ado, our first selector for the evening, Dressed in amazing threads, exquisite threads, showing us all up is Robert Jones Jr., formerly known on social media as, quote, Son of Baldwin, a Brooklyn-based, award-winning writer. He's the author of the New York Times best-selling novel, The Prophets, which was a finalist for the 2021 National Book Award for Fiction, and he's the winner of the 2022 Publishing Triangle Edmund White Award for Debut Fiction. Welcome, Robert, and his threads. Good evening. What is your intrinsic value? How much are you actually worth? Is even considering your worth quantifiable already an indication that you've sold yourself for cheap? Matteo Ascarapur has very heart-expanding and heartbreaking answers to those questions. His debut novel, Black Buck had me shook. Knowing all too well the price and the danger of being the exceptional Negro in gate-kept spaces, there was only one way to tackle this subject matter without crumbling before it. Skillfully, Ascarapur writes with an ultra-modern sense of humor that extends beyond the cool and into the urgent. I learned so much about the ways in which everything is a deal and the ways in which we are dealt. How on levels both micro and macro, war games are played with our lives. Written with a very cinematic sensibility, 
The work of Black Buck is not just wise cracking, but also wise. It is both hip and hip hop. Instruction manual, yes, but more importantly, it is a diagram of the pitfalls, the obstacles, the traps, the carpets pulled from beneath your feet, and the choreography, the levitation required to avoid all of those things. Its brilliance rests in how it gathers us together to unmask every interaction, learn from the jump that behind every crooked smile is a request for a transaction, some for the better, some for the wicked, and some for the unimaginable. The extra added bonus is that there's a reference to Wonder Woman in the novel. And to be honest, that's how I knew it was gonna be legit. <laughs> what I mean to say is, thank you, Mateo, for helping to extinguish the gaslight so that we might better see the stars. And so, family, friends, it is my deepest honor to introduce you to the brother that I call King Hustle, AKA LLTO, AKA He Who Wears the Crown Height. Please give a warm Brooklyn welcome to Mateo Ascarapur. Wow. Big, big gratitude to Robert Jones Jr. Not just for your words, brother, but for bestowing this great honor upon me and just for being a beacon for all of us to look to in times both light and dark and good and bad. Thank you, brother. Let's give it up for the National Book Foundation one time. Thank you for the amazing and necessary work that you do for readers and writers across this nation. It's incredible to be here in Brooklyn, accepting an award down the street from where I live and work. But it wasn't always this way. I wrote Black Buck, my debut novel, in my childhood bedroom on Long Island. You see, I'd moved out, had a whole career in tech that Robert sort of referenced in sales, and then I moved back home. But my room, like myself, had changed in some dramatic ways. Long gone were the soccer posters on the wall, and in their place were shelves of hundreds, literally hundreds of cookbooks, courtesy of my mother right there. <laughs> yeah, there she is. And not only that, but because my parents, including my pops who's right there, they never thought I was gonna move back home. So my bed was gone, and I slept on a futon for a year, having strange, strange dreams about Barefoot Contessa for some reason, but I digress. It was in that room that I planted the seed of a dream a dream that I could be a writer whose words would one day be read by others. A dream that I painstakingly cultivated daily without knowing if it would ever come to fruition. If I, a guy who had no literary background to speak of, who had had a headset surgically attached to his cranium for years, had a place in this esoteric and at times uninviting industry. But that seed eventually began to sprout and I was fortunate enough to meet Many people, fellow farmers, who helped it grow and grow and grow. I'd like to thank my former agent, Tina, my current editor, Pilar, for ensuring that what we yielded was as organic and pesticide-free as possible. I'd like to thank my family and my best friends for sustaining me when I needed it most. And I'd also, I'd also like to thank my many friends who just so happened to write for being their generous, inspiring, and so damn loving selves. I love you all. To anyone with a dream of any kind, it is your duty to protect it, water it, and do your best to make sure that it thrives, not just for yourself, but also for all of those who are watching, who need to witness the wonder of your creation in order to muster the courage to believe, maybe I too have what it takes. Now, 
I'm going to read a little bit from that book that I wrote in that room so long ago, if you'll allow me. This is the beginning of Black Buck, and it's written from the perspective of our protagonist, Darren, a.k.a. Buck. There's nothing like a black man on a mission. No, let me revise that. There's nothing like a black salesman on a mission. He's Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, and any other supernatural, paranormal, or otherwise godlike combination of blood, flesh, and brains. He can't die. Don't believe me? MLK, yes, Martin Luther King Jr. was a black salesman. In the same way used car salesmen hawk overpriced hunks of metal that break down once an unsuspecting customer drives off the lot, our man ML to the goddamn K was a salesman to the highest degree. Not only did he sell black people on the vision of a unified America, but he also sold the United States Supreme Court, which at the time contained nine white men, the hardest decision makers for any black man to convince. MLK, Malcolm X, James Waldron, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Frederick Douglass were all salesmen. Hell, Nina Simone, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and every other black woman who achieved any leap of success was a saleswoman. Oprah, hide a BMW under your seat. Winfrey is a saleswoman. You get the point. Each and every one of these people was selling something more precious than gold. A vision. A vision for what the world could look like if millions of people were to change their minds the hardest thing to change. How do I fit into all of this? When will I shut up and get to the point? Don't worry, I'm getting there. I'm a black man on a mission. No, I'm a black salesman on a mission. And the point of this book, which I'm writing from my penthouse overlooking Central Park, is to help other black men and women on a mission to sell their visions all the way to the top. So high up that I'll have to crane my neck like one of those goofy white people in films deciding whether a superhero is a bird or a plane just to catch a glimpse of them before they're out of sight. Whoosh, bang, poof, the great disappearing act of success. My goal is to teach you how to sell. And if I'm half the salesman every newspaper blog and hustler in New York City says I am, then you are in luck. With my story, I will give you the tools to go out and create the life you want, to overcome every seemingly impossible obstacle, to fix the game. Which game, you ask? We'll get there. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to do three things. Number one, let down your guard and open your mind to what I'm going to tell you. I know we're strangers right now. You're likely asking yourself why you should trust me. The good thing is that you already bought this book, or you're going to after this, in the Brooklyn Museum. So you trusted me enough to part with $26. I won't let you down. Number two, Understand that I want all people to be successful, but in the same way that Starbucks can't just give out mocha frappuccinos to anyone who doesn't have $14, I can't help everyone. So I'm starting with black people. If you're not black but have this book in your hands, I want you to think of yourself as an honorary black person. Go on, do it. Don't go don blackface in an afro, but picture yourself as black. And if you want, you can even give yourself a fancy black name like Jamal, Imani, or Asia. Number three, say every day is deals day and clap your hands. I know it's strange, but do it. And when you do, think of the number one thing you're working toward. It may be a new car or a promotion, someone's affection or an expensive pair of shoes. Whatever it is, think of it and say, every day is deals day and clap your hands as loud as you can. As you'll find out, every day is deals day. A day without deals is like a camel without humps. It doesn't exist. At this point, your heart's beating and there's a twinkle in your eye. I know because I've given this speech before. I've given it to myself. I've given it to thousands of people wanting to change their lives. And I've given it to people who didn't know they wanted to change but needed it. A long time ago, I was one of these people. I was like you, ambitious but afraid, intelligent but impotent, curious, but cowardly. I was all of this and more. But freedom, true freedom, the kind where you do what you want without fear, comes at a cost. It's like my urban corner philosopher, cum fairy god, Uncle Wally Cat used to say. You can change the hands of a clock, but you can't change time. I can give you the tools to change, but only you can change yourself. And if I am successful in teaching you how to sell and fix the game, I ask that you buy another copy of my book and give it to the friend who needs it most who was stuck like I was and in need of a way out, who was blind to the game but has potential.
just like you. Does that sound fair? If so, and if you can do the three things I outlined above, then we have a deal. And if we have a deal, it's time for you to do one last thing. Turn the page. Happy selling. Buck. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Mateo. And buy his book afterwards. Uh, I, said, I asked Mateo, I just met him uh, before this program, I'm like, hey, your last name, it sounds, uh, it sounds Persian. He goes, bro, it's hella Persian. Uh, Mateo Askaripour, congratulations. Next up, we have celebrated author, writer, Kali Fajardo Einstein, who's going to join us. You can give her, yeah, let's go ahead, you do it. She's going to join us to share remarks on behalf of Luis Erdrich. Kali is a national best-selling author of the novel Woman of Lights and the widely acclaimed short story collection Sabrina and Karina, which was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award for Fiction and the winner of the American Book Award. She is the 2023 Guggenheim Fellow, a big deal, and she hails from Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Kali. Chelsea T. Hicks, a member of the Osage Nation, will make her mark on literature with a calm and normal heart. This book had me in its grip from the very first sentence. One time, between a breakup and a shack up, I went home for a visit. How can anyone not keep reading? Next, our character sees an old man traveling down the street, heading west via lawnmower. There is a new museum, there is a movie, there is history. Ms. Hicks brings us home, and home is funny. I love how Chelsea Hicks makes whiplash connections. In a few sentences, she tells a slash of tribal history and then describes a young man dressed in norm core native cool. Hicks writes tense, memorable, alive female characters. Florence, full of know-how in loving, keeping house, rearing children, and Mary, who says something so true about Native life and our disorienting tribal histories. What I hate in the whole wide world right now is that I feel like I live in a different country that's here, inside this one, but no one believes my country exists. Reading that line, so bewildering, so true, gave me a new way to think about the peculiar complexity of Native identity. Every time I've opened a calm and normal heart to write this introduction, I've had to keep reading and rereading and thinking, Chelsea T. Hicks's deadpan, dexterous wit, her audacious, tender, confused, and wise characters and her fierce commitment to storytelling make her a writer to watch. I will have my eye on her, and I know that everyone here tonight at the Five Under 35 will too. Congratulations, Chelsea. We soak we donke. Razi pizze, we we nai. Zani wa we hointi kombra. Ie, ie ekip shedor kombra etsi. Nika wita Darwin, Iowashka Jen, etsi zani. Wakanta wa dompa pita rak rak ewa rapi kombra. Hi everybody, my name is Chelsea. I belong to the Wajaje tribe, and I was speaking in Wajaje Ia, our language that we're revitalizing. And I said, brothers and sisters, I want to uh, say how grateful I am that you're all here. And uh, to acknowledge everyone with respect, and my partner Darwin, who's here, and my agent Jin. And I want to say a few words, and I, I just hope that as Wakanta looks down on us, we are all blessed. And I want to acknowledge that Lenape Majantse, uh, as, as it has already been said, this is Lenape, Delaware, land unceded. 
And that tribe um, is today located in Bartlesville, which is not very far from where I live. It's where my dad grew up. And they have the Delaware Pow Wow at the end of May, so you can all come out if you want. <laughs> I think they would like to maybe have it here one year, except that you know, the community lives there and it takes so much resources, as we know, to be visible. It's so difficult to do what we've had so many in our lives support us to do here tonight to become visible. And so I wanna acknowledge the Delaware tribe's ongoing efforts to be visible here. And they have a Lenape Center in Manhattan and a really good website with information that will direct you toward some information about missing and murdered indigenous women at the Brooklyn uh, li Public Library nearby. So I just feel it's really necessary to say those things because to be up on this stage is such an incredible privilege. And you know I want to do my absolute best to represent. Um, so I wanna thank my parents and my tribe for inspiring me to write this book. And it addresses difficult topics of dysfunction due to ongoing colonization. And in writing this book, I had a lot of help. Inspiration from writers like Kali and Louise Erdrich, and thank you for that incredibly, this incredibly humbling uh, award. And um, Brandon Hobson as well, my, one of my dearest mentors, who they inspired me to write and to keep pushing to tell these stories of Native women. And they supported the book. I would not have been able to get the word out um, about this book without their help and their passion for Native people and passion for justice. And I am also so grateful um, to my editor, Chris, at Unnamed Press and publicist, Allison, as well as Jay and Nicely. And I wanna thank uh, in my community, Maura Redcorn and Ruby Hansen Murray, Brenda Pipestem, and Amy Inglis, because they advocated for this book on behalf of Osages and the wider Native community. Uh, and we are so often erased or not seen. And I, I wanna acknowledge uh, Morgan also here. Yeah, Morgan Tulsi, a friend and Native author. And um, I'm indebted to Christopher Cote, uh, a language teacher who helped me develop and check some of the Osage, Wajajaia language usage within this book and at times helped me with translation work. And I wouldn't be here without Dr. Mogri Lookout who created our orthography. Our language just became written this century. It was an oral language. And he created that uh, alphabet sort of as what you would see it as. Um, we call it an orthography. And Stephanie Rapp and Cameron Pat Pratt who are doing incredible work on the Osage language. So I'm going to read. <laughs> So I'm reading from By Alcatraz, referring to Alcatraz, you know, island in San Francisco. And it's a friends giving story. The only other thing you need to know um, is the character Darren has been um, spiking or putting alcohol in uh, the narrator Mary's drink. And she doesn't know that. And she doesn't drink at all. So it's, you know. Hi, she says. Hi, says Mary. She, Mary couldn't guess the race of her interlocutor by phenotype, but many tiny braids signal that she's in the category of black, which makes Mary think that she should be doing something more in the way of presentation to signal that she is native. But what can she do that isn't totally offensive to herself? If she wore her hair in a left side part with a silk bow, that would be Wajaje. But no one would know. Or she could be like 1920s Wajaje people wanting to be recognizable to Ishtaki, wearing beaded headbands over her forehead in the popular style, popular stereotype of the time. Those old photos always bothered Mary, and she stares at her bare feet. She is standing on a, quote, native inspired rug, probably from a big box store, not native designed or made, as she knows the law requires, but appropriated. Another girl interprets her silence as shyness and intervenes, 
Darren, introductions. This girl has a somewhat thin face and sits shuffling a deck of cards on an upside down milk carton. Mary notices her Care Bear shirt and her very long, very curly hair done into two excellent, tight, native style French braids. Darren speaks. Sorry, this is my date, Mary. Date? The girl with rubber bands bracelets looks over as she picks up a VHS and removes it from its sleeve. Date, Mary repeats. She had thought this was a hangout. Sorry, Friendsgiving date. Darren apologizes again and points at the Care Bears girl. This is Darla. Then he points at the bracelets girl, and that's Joy. So will you guys want to eat soon? Mary cannot believe he's pointing right at people. She would never say yes to a date. Eat maybe in like 30. A third kid with a deep voice says this, and Mary has to step into the room to see him sitting in a bean bag in the far corner. Joy turns from the video machine. Hey, you want to watch Blade Runner? Beanbagger grunts, no, they're not initiates. He is the same light brown as Mary's dad in pictures from the 80s. Mary waves at him. Hi to you too, she says. I didn't see you before. I'm Mary. Latif, he nods. Joy says, so Latif's noting that this is the broken person's club. Are you a broken person? I ask because technically we're a club and you'd have to be a broken person to watch the movie. Mary thinks of not having parents, but having a grandmother until recently. Still, she answers, no. Joy inserts the VHS and presses buttons on the machine. So, why aren't you at home? It's a good question. Mary doesn't want to answer. Nowhere to go at this time, she says. Then she laughs because it sounds like her idea of a business email or a PR lie at this time. Miss Braceleted Tiny Braids VHS Joy looks at Mary like she is crazy, then says, same. Mary turns to Darren. I guess I should have asked the same of you, huh? Why aren't you home? Before he can answer, a random wave of extreme sleepy overwhelms her eyelids closing. Darla jumps up and catches Mary as she falls. Thanks, Mary mumbles. As Darla studies her, Mary considers her possible indigeneity. It's a weird thing to suspect in this moment, but they both have those old fashioned names and the habit of braiding their hair so tight it hurts. So do you want to watch Blade Runner? Darla tries. Her dark brown nose wrinkles as she guides Mary to a bean bag. If you want to watch Blade Runner, just try and share one reason you were, quote, broken. Maybe if she's joining, I should join, Darren suggests, to which all are silent. Mary finds herself averting her eyes in embarrassment, and then Darren leaves quickly, saying he has to tend to the food. Joy relaxes against the armoire holding the TV and draws her legs in close. It would be better if you share how you broke recently or how you are broken now. Mary nods. She knows they are going to judge her by what she says, and she wants friends who are selective and protective, so she focuses on finding the right words. What I hate most in the whole world right now is I feel like I live in a different country that's here inside this one but no one believes my country exists. Godly, thank you. Give it up for Chelsea T. Hicks. And her book is available afterwards that you all have to purchase. Now, Jim Shepard will read remarks on behalf of Karen Russell. Jim has written eight novels and five story collections, including Like You to Understand, Anyway, a finalist for the National Book Award and the winner of the Story Prize. He teaches at Williams College. Please welcome our special guest, Jim. Hey, everybody. 
In the words of the endlessly wonderful Karen Russell, uh, I am so happy to celebrate Morgan Talty and the other amazing 535 honorees with you tonight in this appropriately uncanny manner from under the banner of the legendary writer Jim Shepard's mustache. <laughs> and as an aside, if that line seems to you like appalling log rolling, you should know that I insisted on my descriptor being legendary. And Karen, in fact, had wanted to go with virtually unknown. Anyway, back to Karen. In fact, Jim was the one who first recommended Night of the Living Res to me, a book he calls a spectacularly visceral and moving account of the experience of a member of the Penobscot Nation in today's America, as well as a wrenching meditation on family and familial dysfunction. And while we're not here to applaud Jim Shepard's clairvoyance, he knows a great book when he reads one, and Night of the Living Res has gone on to win a half a dozen prestigious awards. It appeared on countless best of lists and has turned Jim and I into Talty fans for life. Not only is Morgan a brilliant writer, he's also a beloved editor and mentor, say, Morgan Talty to anyone who has worked with him and watched them go incandescent. One of his former students, Lavanya Vesudovan, told me, if attention is a form of love, I think we should take the love that Morgan gives freely and without expectation and return it tenfold. For here's a person who deserves all the attention in the world. Morgan Talty, I guess this begs the question, are you tired of hearing praise from Morgan Talty? <laughs> I hope the answer is no, because I'm certain this is only the beginning. And I also know that this debut book is the work of a lifetime. Night of the Living Res is set on the Penobscot Indian Nation Reservation in Maine, a verb set that sounds deceptively static. In Talti's work, setting is never merely the backdrop. The island with its river, swamp, and woods is always changing, just like the people who live on the island. Dee and Phyllis and Mom and Paige. Nature structures Dee's memories, like mist in the pines or fall webworms in the brown crooks of branches. Home and family are dynamic, intertwined and alive. And on the island, Talti's characters struggle with addiction, illness, loneliness, longing, the ongoing violence of colonialism, and the everyday violence within families, where the poltergeist of pain jumps from body to body. Grief cycles through Dee's family, fresh and ancient, and so do jokes and warmth and love. Howls of agony become howls of laughter. And Morgan Talty is a master of deadpan humor, delivering truths that feel both comic and consequential. How did we get here and how do we get out of here sometimes have the same answer Dee observes in Half-Life. A few months ago, Morgan became the father of Charlie, a newborn with a dimple so adorable that like an eclipse, it's actually dangerous to look at straight on. As with Morgan's stories, daring to look is worth the risk. Of all the invisible forces that haunt Night of the Living Res, love is the most mysterious and the most powerful. What a treacherous thing to love another person in this life that mixes astonishment and joy with so much suffering. Thank you for reminding us, Morgan, that it's the necessary thing. Morgan Talty, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Um, I wrote this before I knew Jim was gonna be introducing me, so he's not even thanked in here. Um, I apologize, but thank you, Jim. I'm always, I don't know, like I, thank you, Karen Russell, who I wrote that and Jim read it. Um, I, I w always go off script. I don't know why they even gave me this. Um, whenever there is another indigenous person in the room or speaking and they you know, are speaking in their native language, you know, I'm always like, all right, I have to think of some words to pull, you know, if I'm going to come up here. So I would like to say to everybody, Nadachwi Sigiazi, which means I really have to pee. Um, <laughs> um, but I w would like to actually say Wuli Wani, which is thank you. Um, I'm deeply honored to be named a five under 35, along with these four other fantastic writers. I want to give my sincerest thanks to Karen Russell, um, who nominated me, and Jim, who eloquently read her, word, uh, her words. Um, and I also want to thank my wonderful wife, Jordan, who was at home watching our son, Charlie. Um, if you follow me on social media, I don't have to tell you how ridiculously cute he is. 
but if you don't, just take my word for it. I also have to give a huge thanks to the Brooklyn Museum for hosting us all tonight, and a huge thanks to the National Book Foundation for everything they do and offer for writers and readers. Finally, I want to thank my Tin House family, my amazing editor, Maisie Cochran, my publicist, Becky Kramer, who, in the face of fabricated and insurmountable evidence, went to bat for me when I pretended to be a hotel manager who claimed I burned half a room down from smoking cigarettes on my book tour, my publisher, Craig Poplars, who supports me, yeah, yeah, I, it, I went, the, I, I really went out on a limb for that one. Um, she called them and she asked to speak to Carl, the manager, and they were like, there's no manager named Carl here. Um, would like to thank my publisher, Craig Poplars, who supports me in every way possible, Nancy McClowski for all she has done to champion my work, and my wonderful agent, Rebecca Friedman, who I consider not just a friend, but family. I'd now like to read a small section from my opening story, Burn, um, in Night of the Living Res. Uh, so this is the very first story readers are introduced to, um, and it's narrated by Dee, who is uh, the narrator throughout the entire book. Winter, and I walk the sidewalk at night along banks of hard snow. I'd come from Rab's apartment off the reservation. Rab, this white guy with a wide mouth and eyes that closed up when he laughed, sold pot. He was all no bullshit, too. I had asked for a gram, and after I, reached in my, after I reached in my pants and jacket pockets looking for the cash among the cigarette wrappers and pocket knife, and he, of course I would do this, I reached into my pants and jacket pockets looking for the cash among the cigarette wrappers and pocket knife, and he didn't believe me as I acted the part and kept saying, shit, 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 it must have fell out on the walk over here. He shook his head, took the weed out of the baggie and put it back into his mason jar. I ain't smoking you up, he said. And so then I said, fuck you, Rab. I really did lose the money. You'll see. Watch when I come back here in 30 minutes with the money I dropped. You'll feel stupid then. He shrugged a sorry, man, and I slammed his door shut as I left. At the bridge to the reservation, the river was still frozen, ice shining white blue, white blue under a full moon. The sidewalk on the bridge hadn't been shoveled since the last nor'easter crap snow in November, and I walked in the boot prints everyone made who walked the walk to Overdown to get pot or catch the bus to wherever it was us Skijans had to go, which wasn't anywhere because everything we needed, except pot, was on the res. Well, except Best Buy or Bed Bath & Beyond, but those natives who bought 4K Ultra DVDs or fresh white doilies had cars, wouldn't be taking the bus like me or Fellas did each day to the methadone clinic. That was another thing the res didn't have, a methadone clinic. But we had sacred grounds where sweats and peyote ceremonies happened once a month, except since I had chosen to take methadone, I was ineligible to participate in native spiritual practice, according to the doc on the res. Natives damning natives. Kiji Willy Wendy. Thank you. Give it up for new dad Morgan. The fact that he's here Lucid, awake, well done, sir, well done. And also give it up uh, for our translators. I was uh, watching her reading your story and I was like, that was amazing. So give it up for our two translators who are doing all the hard work. Next up, we have author Kevin Nguyen, who will share remarks on behalf of Kristen Valdez Quaid. Kevin is the author of New Waves, one of the best books of 2020 according to NPR, and the forthcoming novel, my Documents. He's also the features editor of The Verge. Welcome, Kevin. I think unlike the rest of the books, uh, Jenny's book is not out yet, so it's out June 20th. Uh, so <clears throat> I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can buy it after this event, but you should try and find it, and that might be illegal. But do it. Okay, here's Kristen. When Jenny Shia's lovely, large-hearted debut, Holding Pattern, opens, Kathleen Chang has dropped out of her PhD program, been dumped by her fiance, and has moved back to her mother Marissa's house in Oakland. Marissa is no longer the depressed alcoholic she was during Kathleen's childhood. She no longer needs Kathleen to wipe vomit off her mouth or guide her to bed. She has shed her past as she's shed her weight. Now, vacuum sealed in spandex, she is forceful and optimistic and forward-looking, ready to seize her life, married to a wealthy younger man, determined to finally occupy the future she'd imagined for herself when she moved from Shanghai all those years ago. But first, she needs to plan her wedding, and Kathleen will be her maid of honor. Kathleen's mother's transformation highlights her own failures in isolation. Kathleen may have dropped out of her PhD program studying haptics, but she's still drawn to seek, un 
She's still drawn to seek to understand touch and human closeness. She finds herself uniquely qualified and also out of her depth at her new job as a certified cuddler at a company called The Midas Touch. It's a business that can only take root in the Bay Area, and she obscures the Bay Area, but lovingly. The apps and the startups and the sense of possibility and the precarity and the striving that underpins it all. Jenny Shia's prose is assured, witty, and lovely. Holding pattern is a sharply intelligent, holding pattern is sharply intelligent about the nuances of human relationships. The character is beautifully and precisely observed, rendered with a keen eye and a generous heart. I wanted this novel to go on and on. And as I neared the end, I found myself already missing the characters, who had become my own friends, and I slowed my pace to stretch out the pleasure of reading. By turns funny and charming and searching and mournful, Holding Pattern is a lively and gorgeously crafted portrait of a complicated relationship between a mother and a daughter. As each woman faces the circumstances of her new life, she must contend with her shared history, the messy and painful past that belongs to them alone. As Kathleen watches her mother spin in her wedding dress, she observes, no matter how like we might have looked or how much time we'd spent together, we were as distant as stars. She was like anyone you loved in that way. The more intimately you knew her, the more closely you beheld the wind, uh, the more closely you beheld the wild, unbreachable distance that would keep you from perfect understanding. This was my experience getting to know these characters, from the marvelous Marissa to the grievous widower who becomes Kathleen's favorite cuddle client, to the friends Kathleen and in, in, to the friends in Kathleen and Marissa's orbit perhaps even including Milo, the rat of Instagram fame. Each character was, until the last line, delightful and complicated and always unfolding. Moving, open-hearted, and astute, holding pattern as a splendid debut. Congrats, Jenny. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, yeah, I feel like I would be remiss not to say it is out June 20th, which is almost this month, and also, how are we mid-year? Um, I actually held the first hardcover copy today. Y'all have a copy and I don't, so that was really cool. Um, thank you. So every year I look forward to the announcement of the 535 and you see it because Twitter goes effervescent with congratulations and Instagram lights up with fire emojis. And we take the time to celebrate writers and these have been people that I deeply admire, that I learn from and more recently have been lucky enough to call friends. I love to cheer from the sidelines, so it's a surreal and unexpected honor to be named this year. And I'm really glad I picked up the call. Ruth Dickey, the executive director, called me, and I never pick up phone calls, I don't know, because I get 20 spam calls a day. But I was getting groceries delivered, and I thought maybe they were here. But it was something, <laughs> it was something much better. Um, so I want to extend my immense thanks to the National Book Foundation and Kirsten Valdez Quaid for giving Holding Pattern a platform and to my incredible, brilliant agent, Sarah Bolin, who's here somewhere. Hi. <laughs> um, and my editor, Allison Fairbrother at Riverhead. Two women without whom my words would still be mush. I'm so grateful to have some dear friends in the audience that I've been here for the journey and to be surrounded by people who believe in stories and their outsized power. I think many of you in this room know how unlikely it is for any book to exist at all. How many people have to touch it and coax it to life? How many years it takes? How delusional you have to be? How so much of writing is just not, not writing. I've not, not written most of my life because of humbling moments like this and generous and big-hearted communities like this. Thank you for coming together. I hope I can extend the same encouragement to anyone who might be doubting to keep going. Um, I'm just gonna keep it simple and I'll read from the very beginning. Heartbreak was its own kind of incandescence that morning, scrubbing the world raw with its floodlight. It felt acutely out of place among Marin's pristine streets and quaint signage, its veneer of health and wealth an insult I couldn't answer. As we entered the bridal shop, my mother wrapped a hand around my bicep and squeaked her excitement, and this grated on me too. Not so many years ago, she might have clung to me like this, her breath a lank cloud of vomit and liquor. Inside the shop, a series of alcoves illuminated a froth of white dresses. The other clients were expensively dressed, model-esque women, 
with the exception of a boy in a basketball jersey who was slumped on a clear acrylic bench, frowning at the handheld Nintendo between his knees. I cast a line of hope in his direction, seeking acknowledgement of our mutual misery, but he kept his eyes trained on the game. Good morning, ladies. A bridal consultant tottered toward us, legs bound by a black pencil skirt. Welcome to Francesca, she said in chirping tones. My mother fitted her sunglasses to the crown of her head, removing her hand from my arm. My grief swelled again to the boundary of skin. Hi, I'm Marissa. We have 10 o'clock meeting. Her halting English, English, which I've grown accustomed to, newly wrinkled in the marmoral perfection of the shop. This my daughter, Kathleen. Today she find the dress for wedding. The consultant who introduced herself as Greta pumped my hand. So exciting. Congratulations on the engagement, Kathleen. Actually, she's the one getting married. I'm her maid of honor, I said. Her smile froze. Oh, that's wonderful. Why don't you girls come back with me? As we followed, my mother whispered in Mandarin, let's have fun. Don't worry about how much it is. This excursion and the Big Sur wedding that was three months away was financed by her fiance. Brian Lynn owned a software company called Wayfinder that, as far as I could understand, leveraged personal data and real-time location to herd people into buying lattes or visiting the zoo. When they had started dating a little over two years ago, my mother had said, I'm going to love him in the same tone she might have used for, I'll finally be able to redo the kitchen. Money had always been elusive for us. We were diligent with our frugality, elevating it to a kind of morality, especially after my parents' divorce. Birthday parties I attended caused agonizing negotiations over the spending limit and the inevitable shame when the kid unwrapped a mountain of presents more titillating than mine. Trips to the movie theater were tolerated only if we strung together three back-to-back -to -back screenings. I learned the strange pleasure of self-denial of trying on a pair of jeans I'd lusted after for weeks, only to slough them off and leave the would-be version of myself hanging in the dressing room. In that way, everything in my adolescence was calculated against assimilation. Every precious dollar diverted from, diverted from the frivolity of fitting in brought us closer to the middle class. At the grocery store, my mother paused in each aisle as she sifted through the stack of coupons she dutifully harvested from the mail. Often, by a trick of sales and double coupons, the store owed her cash at the register. It had seemed like a triumph, however measly, within the system. Now we entered a cavern of dresses arranged by color. The fabrics hung suggestively, a rustling hedge of satin and silk. I had never been, to my mother's frustration, a frilly dresser. Warmth crept up my cheeks. I felt as though I was choosing lingerie. My bridemaid wearing pink, purple, my mother told Greta. She tapped her phone, enlarged the Pinterest image, Brian must have shown her how to use the app, and held the screen aloft. I think lawn dress, my daughter like a size six. 10, I amended. So pretty, said Greta, nodding at the screen. Every, any preference in neckline? Not strapless, I said, words colliding with my mother's. No straps. Greta laughed, exposing a long incisor. Opinionated women. Okay, let me just grab a couple dresses that I think you'll adore, and I'll meet you in the dressing room. The private room had a trifled mirror at one end and a padded bench at the other. My mother set down her bag and began walking, heel-toe, heel-toe toward her reflection, her body contoured by performance wear. I'd only been back in California for a week, and I was still adjusting to the new Marissa Chang. This woman was happier than the one I'd grown up with, more robust. This woman was empowered and had means, or at least she'd be marrying her means atop a seaside bluff come August. With her new fiance, she sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge, climbed sandstone boulders, ran loops in the Oakland Hills, all things unimaginable for the Marissa I knew, who spent her spare hours cleaning the house and watching television, a bottle of wine beside her. But now, as she described her recent outings with Brian, my gaze grew slack and her face separated into two overlapping orbs. Then I studied the unfamiliar features. It wasn't that the nose had grown or that the lips had migrated, but that I was seeing her from the perspective of a stranger, as if for the first time. There were, of course, real physical changes. At 53, my mother had always been petite, but now she was trim, her hair smartly angled toward her jaw. 
Her recent weight loss had revealed the delicate planes of her face like petals flaking away from a shrouded bud. She had traded her mom capris and department store blouses for athletic gear in her spandex pants and fleece half zips. She looked sporty and self-possessed, the type of woman who might race up a switchback with a mantra pulsing in her chest. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. I miss the old Marissa. At least she would have provided a dreary comfort. Thank you. All right, everyone, let's do this. We're gonna take out our phone. Just take out your phone. Just follow my lead for a second. Type in Jenny Shia, it's very easy. It's Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y, last name X-I-E. You guys with me? Holding pattern is the novel. You got it? Purchase it. <laughs> All right, God is watching. All right, there you go. Give it up for Jenny. Book's coming out next month, congrats. Last but not certainly least, we have author Jamil John Kochai, who is the author of The Haunting of Haji Hotak and Other Stories, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and he's the author of 99 Nights in Logar, which was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award for a debut novel. He was born in an Afghan refugee camp in Peshawar, Pakistan, but originally hails from Logar, Afghanistan. Currently, he is a Hodder Fellow at Princeton University. Give it up for Jamil. I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Munse Lanape people. May Allah provide a route for return and reclamation to all the indig indigenous people of this territory and across the earth, including the people of Kashmir and Palestine, continuously suffering under the brutality of settler colonialism and the sorrows of displacement. <clears throat> when I first came upon Ada Zhang's short story, Sister Machinery, I was immediately struck by its narrative voice. The narrator of Sister Machinery is smart, funny, endearing, and just the right amount of voicey. It was as if the character was sitting before me and telling the story aloud. There was a lovely oral quality to the piece. So I thought, wonderful, I could get used to this. Let me see what else Zhang has in store for me. But when I began to read the whole collection, The Sorrows of Others, I wasn't at all prepared for the dexterity of these stories. The humor is recurring, certainly. So is the vibrancy of the language. But then there's the wisdom, the precise, pitch-perfect details, the quiet, almost timeless souring of her beautiful characters. Take this opening sentence from the titular story, The Sorrows of Others, and I quote, the apartment was eerily clean, and he wondered if she had not been trying to restore, sorry, the apartment was eerily clean, and he wondered if she had not been trying to restore the place so much as to make it foreign to him. A perfect sentence that encapsulates the entire story as a whole. Time and again, Zhang's stories reminded me of William Trevor at his best, or Anton Chekhov, or Jahumpa Lahiri, or even Ian Li. What I mean to say is, Zhang's stories echo mastery. I am so deeply grateful for her writing, and it is such a profound honor to be able to introduce her tonight. Congratulations, Ada. Thank you, Jamil, for that generous introduction. Um, Jamil is a writer I've admired and respected for a really long time, so it was a double honor to the five under 35 under his nomination. Um, really quickly, I'd like to thank uh, my publisher, Public Space, um, my editor, the iconic Bridget Hughes, and my agent, David McCormick, who has had my back since day one. Um, thank you to the National Book Foundation for this enormous recognition. It's already done wonders for my book and helped it reach readers. Um, and thank you, of course, to the Brooklyn Museum for hosting us tonight. And thank you to you all for attending. Um, this is the five under 35 and I am the fifth, so you're almost there. And uh, uh, we, can, we can party after this. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to share this moment with everyone. Um, Jamil already uh, read the first sentence and I am going to be <laughs> Uh, reading from uh, the title story from my collection, The Sorrows of Others. Um, here we go. 
The apartment was eerily clean, and he wondered if she had not been trying to restore the place so much as to make it foreign to him. Surfaces shone, fruit, which he always let sit in plastic bags, now rested decoratively in a glass bowl. Even useless objects and drawers, trinkets and receipts that had somehow accumulated were given their own containers, shallow jewelry boxes that she had presumably collected over the years and brought with her to her new home. She had been there for only one night, and already he had to ask her, his new wife, where to find his lightweight coat, his materials for calligraphy, the small spoons he liked for his tea. You sit, she said to him, getting up from the couch where she was reading a newspaper. He saw when she put it down that it was one from last month. I'll get it. Before he could object and say that the tea had already been made, that he just needed to know where the spoons were, she was off. Her steps were small, he noticed, and quick, slippers clapping evenly from the living room all the way to the kitchen. When his daughter had called a month earlier to say she had found the perfect match, someone he might connect with since the woman had happened to be from his hometown, his reaction had moved from shock to humiliation. He had no idea that his daughter had been searching or that his current situation was a problem that needed to be resolved. I'm fine on my own, he said to Xiao An, following a silence on the phone. She's never been married, she replied. In her 40s, parents dead, no kids. Also, you're both from Changwu, so you already have something to talk about. I'm telling you, ba. Even fate couldn't have come up with someone better. I don't understand, how did this come about? A matchmaking agency called Planet Love for people middle-aged and older. I made you a profile. Bah, don't be prudish, Xiao An continued when he was quiet. Everyone goes through a matchmaker these days. The young, the rich, everyone's looking for love. His daughter, whom he affectionately called Little Comfort, had been motherless since she was two years old. She possessed a determination that she got from neither him nor her mother, and every time she sensed an opportunity, she was quick to snatch it up. She'd moved to Shanghai for college and had been there ever since. Twice a year, she came back to Xi'an to check on her father and to complain to him about the rigors of life in a tier one city. The housing market, construction, supermodels and actors walking with their noses up as though the whole city stank, which, she added, it did. She compared it with the relative ease of Xi'an, which was still considered tier two, though they both knew that with tourism on the rise all over the country, the imperial capital was also changing. Song Ha had a humbler attitude toward risk, harboring the superstition that only if he rarely took chances would the world occasionally give him what he wanted. His first marriage to the woman he'd loved was his prize, he'd thought, for living cautiously. Until one day his young wife died of an aneurysm in her sleep. After that he stopped believing in his formula, but his aversion to risk grew harsher. He stared at his dead wife's photograph once a month, keeping it in the drawer of his nightstand, where he also stored the watch she'd given him on his 26th birthday at the beginning of their love, which ended up being not far from the end. His sole ambition now was to live a quiet life, not to disturb others or be disturbed. He'd remained single for the past 32 years. Another person could only bring complications. What does she want out of marriage? Songha asked his daughter. Does it say anywhere in her profile? It says she wants a roommate to whom she can offer her sympathy, Xiao An said. Not exactly the most exciting plea for romance, but that's all she put. Thank you. All right, that's five under 35. Give it up. Uh, the very wealthy, powerful people have told me that you have to evacuate immediately because we have gone over time. So there's going to be no Q&A. However, uh, since it really doesn't bother me because I'm not paying the bill, I'm going to stretch it out for a minute and do something a bit different. I'm going to invite the 5 under 35 and their presenters on the stage so you guys can you know, give them some love. Let's give it up for the 5 under 35. Ada, Zhang, we have... Uh, Chelsea T. Hicks, we got Matea, Mateo, and we have Jenny, and I'm missing one. I'm miss Morgan, the exhausted dad. Come on up real quick. And their presenters, come on up. No, I see you, Kali, you gotta get up. Robert, you gotta get up. Special guest Jim, Kevin, and Jamil. You can give a nice little wave if you want. This is for your family and friends.
Give it up, give it up for the 535 and the presenters, all writers, authors. All right, Robert, you're going to have to lead with a bow. All right, here we go. Ready? Don't mess it up. All right, all right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the National Book Foundation. Thank you to Brooklyn Museum. This is the first time this has ever been made public. I think it's important for our words to be shared, to be heard, to be celebrated. If you don't share these words, these words and these stories die. And I want to remind you in the past year in the United States of America, more than 2,300 books have been banned. Librarians, educators, teachers, and writers are under assault just for sharing our stories and our words. And also, these amazing authors need to eat. So you have to support them. The best way to support them is to come to the events like this and also to spend your money and invest in their words, purchase their books, which will be available outside in the Beau Arts Court. And I've heard there are drinks and libations and very delicious cheeses that you can eat, but I can't. And they will be there to sign their books that you will be able to purchase. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for hosting this event. <laughs> support authors, support writers, support librarians. Take care.